Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I'm delighted to be with you. Come to think about it in my present condition, I'm delighted to be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I feel complimented by your presence here this morning. Now, if my voice seems just a little bit shaky, please understand I'm still in recovery. But this morning I want to revisit the past and relate to the present. The title of my talk this morning is Mr. Average, with a question mark. I want to take you back to the year of 1971. I was 39 years of age with a young teenage family and through my own stupidity had gone through three major business failures and for 13 long years nothing seemed to go right for me. I had to adjust. The lessons I learned were many. I lost everything. But I kept my faith and my character. And I knew that God was teaching me and I nourished the thought that I was being preserved for higher things. I was just starting to taste the sweetness of business success. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, almost overnight, I became front page news. I appeared on every television channel. And I found myself in the middle of the dirtiest fight in the world, almost alone. What was I doing there? They were calling me a religious fanatic, a Bible basher, Peter the Baptist. I was getting disgusting late night phone calls, hate mail. And what did I do? to stimulate all this intense anger. Well, I was simply challenging the decency of a stage play that I believed degraded the dignity of womanhood. And I stood firm, resolute, and immovable. It seemed to me the ways of decency and respect were being challenged. The libertines were claiming that if it feels good, do it. This was the era of flower power and the hippies. The universities invited me to a confrontation with their students and I vigorously accepted their challenge and to their surprise I held my ground. After a hostile debate, three young men approached me and quietly told me that they were Christians and thanked me for coming. And I exploded to them. I said, while everyone else was booing, why weren't you cheering? The pressure was mounting. My physical and mental and spiritual reserves were almost depleted. When I turned and arrived at home, an old friend called Jim was waiting to see me. And feeling somewhat flat, I unburdened some of my concerns in respect to the moral future of our country to him. Our discussions continued to two o'clock in the morning. And at that point, I just shook my head as an act of closure to the conversation. And Jim sat back and he said, well, Brother Peter, praise the Lord anyhow. Now, if someone says that to you at two o'clock in the morning and you're exhausted, you start to get into disbelief. And I said to Jim, I said, Jim, back it up with scripture. In a matter of fact way, he opened his Bible at the Old Testament at the book of Habakkuk. And he read aloud these words with confidence. Though the fig tree shall not blossom and there is no fruit on the vine, Though the product of the olive fails and the field yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stall, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will exalt in the victorious God of my salvation. 
And he paused for just a moment, and then with a smile said, <laughs> Praise the Lord anyhow. <laughs> you know, gentlemen, I've contemplated that event over many, many years. And it's often caused me to focus on the frailty of mankind against the mercy and goodness of a loving, forgiving God. And in a way, it relates to all of us here this morning, including myself. I know we all do it. In our weakness and desperation, we plead and try to bargain with God, often adjusting our commitments relative to our moods and our situation dynamics. It's happened before. It happened way back in Genesis when Jacob did it. And it said, And Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in the way that I go, and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear, so that I may come to my father's house in peace, <laughs> then the Lord shall be my God. Loyalty if. Jacob's commitment had a host of conditions, very much like most of us here this morning that in our weakness we try to convince God that if he gives us everything we want, he has our commitment of worship and honour. And we try to persuade God that this is a good deal and he's lucky to get us. <laughs> Loyalty if. If you do all these things for me, God, then I will worship you. We're all guilty of it at some time or other. Loyalty if. But I study my Bible and it takes it to a higher level. And the psalmist does it when it says these words. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Loyalty because. Loyalty if. That type of commitment is related to receiving a reward. Maybe when something wonderful happens, you respond with a song of praise, a reflection of gratitude towards God's goodness, loyalty because it's a happy response to a wonderful gift. Loyalty because, because there is a commitment that graduates to a higher plateau. And I want to take you there. A belief that is strong and sacred, a plateau that defies all logic and declares absolute loyalty. It was to cost the martyrs their lives down through the ages and unfortunately it still does today, just as was presented by my friend Jim as he read from the book of Habakkuk so many years ago. Though the fig tree shall not blossom. There is no fruit on the vines, the product of the olive fails and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no cattle in the stalls, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the victorious God of my salvation. And it triumphantly declares, loyalty nevertheless. Loyalty nevertheless. Praise the Lord anyhow. Loyalty if, loyalty because, or loyalty nevertheless. Well, that experience that I shared with you that I had was many years ago. Public opinion was alerted. Would you believe it? We had a great march in King William Street. It stretched from North Terrace right up to Curry Street and filled the whole of King William Street. It demonstrated public concern. The politicians took notice. And finally, with the Supreme Court battle, victory was won, and it was reported by at least one newspaper that it was the first time in 200 years in the British Empire that pornography against women had been victoriously defeated. The conscience of our nation that was stirred a residue still remains at the Festival of Light 
where they have a member of parliament in New South Wales. But that's all in the past. There are many other battles to be fought. And unfortunately today our faith in what we stand for as Bible-believing Christian men is being falsely judged on the basis of the outrageous, wicked behaviour of those who claim to be Christians that have ravaged the innocent. And all the good and continuous sacrificial works still being performed by Christians is being nullified. Our voice has been gagged. Our principles are out of date. We're living in an age of so-called political correctness. Life is expedient. You are not even protected inside the womb. And it may not be long before there is an age time of sufficiency when you may be expected to self-destruct when you are deemed to be no longer useful. I'm sure that there are those of you here this morning that feel some, in your spirit that something is desperately wrong. Truth in our nation seems to have taken a holiday as being protected by a bodyguard of lies. We're living in a consciousness mental climate that could not only affect our present security but the lives of the future generations to come. It does seem at times as Christians we are overemphasizing what we cannot do and at the same time undervaluing what we are capable of doing. Whatever happened to that great hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers Marching Against the War, with the cross of Jesus going on before. I mean, I only have to repeat that and I get goosebumps. I know what you're thinking. I'm just an average guy, nothing special. What do you expect of me? Don't put the bar too high and then expect me to jump it. I can't do anything. I'm just an average guy. I go to vote on polling day. I work at an average job. I do average things around the house. We pay the average mortgage. We buy the average groceries at the local su supermarket. Don't expect me to understand or even care about Albert Einstein's theory of relativity or quantum physics. I have no idea or even care why they want to probe into outer space when we haven't solved the problems we have here on Earth. And don't give me all that garbage and stuff about market economy. Look, just give me some job security, a fair wage, and I'll plot along day by day, week by week, minding my own business. And somehow I'll try and make ends meet. And in the process, I'll look after my family by taking and picking up our kids from school and trying to keep my marriage together. And when I can, I try to get some excitement and entertainment by going to a football match or the movies. And believe me when I say, really, I'm just an average guy. And most of the time I feel unimportant. And I feel insignificant, unappreciated. And I have to admit it at times that I look at those who seem effortlessly to forge ahead and wonder where I might have gone wrong. And why I seem to miss out on all the lucky breaks. Yeah, I may go to church regularly, but I still struggle to live out my faith in, in a meaningful way. And I ask myself this question, is it all worth it? And does it really make any difference? But of course you protest and you say, but I'm average. And I continue feeling somewhat used as support fodder for all that is happening around me. And you may complain and say you're not aware of any crucial role that you play in the kaleidoscope of happenings that constantly surround you. Or maybe you're not conscious of what any link that might have in the stability of the long chain of national, indeed global events. But maybe you haven't even thought about it. Well, this morning is your wake-up call. Because the average people do help to hold things together. 
And I suppose without the continued daily routine of the average masses of people, the government would soon collapse. Without the average man doing his job, telecommunications would fail. The banks would have no money and all the stores would have no produce. The factories would become rusty, useless machines. Without Mr and Mrs Average, they would have no one to clean our hospitals and run our transportation. And I suppose we would all have to agree that without the average citizen, there would be no one to risk their life to defend our country. And when we stop and think about it, without the average person, the leaders would have no followers. The wealthy would become impoverished. And the real heroes in war and in peace are just the average people who receive no medals or honours. You know what? They don't even look for it. And we know that politicians only recognise you when they want to get your vote and quickly forget you when they are elected. And then they create complicated, unjust laws to control and restrict you under the mysterious, unexplainable title of the common good. And then they're surprised why you don't trust them. I'm a student of history. I've studied history for over 50 years. I guess the thing that we learn from history is we don't learn from history. But do you know the horrors of the French Revolution was avoided by England, not by the government, but according to Lecky, the Irish historian, it was prevented by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ through John Wesley Amen. that made an incredible impact for good and justice, which was unfortunately unheeded by the Russian royalty and opened the doors to the disaster of communism. Now, gentlemen, we are all in this together. Leaders need to remember and recognise that Mr and Mrs Average are the strong links in the chain of all human events. The average Christian man and woman is the glue that holds this nation together. And sometimes we all tend to overlook the fact that our personal presence at church every week signifies who we are and what we represent. And when you walk through the door of your church, you're in the very presence of the people who love God. And you are noticed. You are recognised. Because we belong to a multitude of believers that the Bible describes in my Bible as a cloud of witnesses. We are no longer average. As Christians, we have within our souls a Holy Spirit and a forgiveness that defies any explanation. Now, having been ill for some time, I watch a lot of television. My favourite program is The Antique Roadshow. And I particularly enjoy watching some seemingly insignificant person waddle into the experts and present an object for value, identification and history. And very often when they are questioned in respect to the origin of the artefact, they seem to stiffen up and stand a little taller. You watch them and unroll and proudly present their personal heritage related to the object under examination. Well, let me tell you, as Christians, we are not average. We have a great heritage. We are related and identified with Abraham and all the prophets of old, the disciples, all the martyrs for Christ down through the centuries. We, Christians, abolish the slave trade and child labour. We feed the hungry. We care for the sick. We help the poor and educate the illiterate. Christians have influenced music, mathematics, farming, literature, architecture, government, law, business, art. And we have permeated goodness throughout the whole world, throughout history. And yet there are still those that are rejected by identifying some misuse and manipulation under the disguise of Christianity, such as the Crusades, 
the bombings in Belfast, the forced baptism under Constantine, the Inquisitions. But our detractors have left no great epitaphs or lasting values to demonstrate any superior replacement. Real Christianity stands alone. It is a true benefactor of all mankind and indeed into the entire world. And it's not the great evangelists that hold our faith together in everyday life. It's a so-called average Christian person that challenges the careless throwaway phrases used by people who criticize and oppose what we stand for. That is why when you go out there after this meeting, you need to stand afresh in a crowd and be bold and ask why in respect of the issues that conflict with our faith. And be ready to admit that we all struggle in our Christian faith. But we have a calling. Yes, we, do. we believe in salvation. We have a set of values and belief in everlasting life. Now, who am I talking to this morning? I'm talking to the very people that we cannot do without in this nation, strong Christian men. And we must never forget the way that we conduct ourselves in private can never be concealed and the way that we behave in public may be the only Bible some people read. We believe that the legal loopholes may rarely equate to moral judgments and what is convenient may not always be right. Our example as a Christian man will impact more people than any explanation that you can give. We will continue to do good works. We are unstoppable. We will never give up, let up or shut up until God takes us up. The value we have as Christians does not decrease based on someone's inability to recognise all the good that we do. And we will always endeavour to live up to our true potential. You're still struggling. Nothing wonderful is happening in your life. Feeling unappreciated. Let me close with a little story. Many years ago, in obedience to the call of God, a brilliant Christian doctor sacrificed a profitable medical career to spend his life attending to the sick in a foreign land. When he was old and weary and could do no more, he returned home. And when the ship docked, there was quite a considerable delay because some VIPs were first to disembark, accompanied by a cheering crowd and a brass band. There were porters there who carried their luggage and they were whisked away in limousines. The old doctor waited patiently for about two hours and struggling with his few meagre possessions walked unsteadily down the gangplank and managed to board a bus that took him to a small basement room where he could modestly outlive the rest of his life. He looked around the sparsely furnished room and immediately fell on his knees and stretched his hands towards heaven and started to sob out to God these words. In obedience to your call on my life, I went with my newly wedded wife to a foreign land to share your mercy and love. I buried my wife and two children there and now I have returned alone. There was no one to greet me. No band played acknowledging my work or my return. There was no one to assist me with my luggage. No limousine to bring me here. I received no welcome. No one cheered, no homecoming, no gratitude. He wept bitterly until he heard the voice of God within his own soul say these words, my son, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. Yes, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there is no fruit on the vines, 
They're the product of the olive fields and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the victorious God of my salvation, whatever happens. So in conclusion, I ask the question to myself and each one of you. When things get rough, what are you going to do? Lordly if, lordly because, or loyalty nevertheless. God bless you and thank you.